Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium, and uh, also please uh, fill out your program evaluations. And uh, as I generally do, I will uh, request that uh, if you have any ideas in regards to future topics or future speakers, the CME committee is always very appreciative of those. Um, today, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Denise Sorrentino. Uh, Dr. Sorrentino is uh, board certified in uh, both cardiology and uh, electrophysiology, having done her fellowships uh, in both at Emory and Atlanta. And uh, she has uh, kindly accepted the CME committee's uh, um, uh, invitation to, to uh, provide us with an update on a, a problem that I see on uh, several times a day basis, actually. And uh, please welcome me, or welcome uh, Dr. Denise Sorrentino. Thank you. Hello, and thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, you know, when I got the invitation to do atrial fibrillation as a topic, I, I don't never know how an audience will accept that. As Dr. Hallberg said, this is one of those common bread and butter topics that physicians in all specialties see. No one's not included, including the pediatricians. They have patients with atrial fibrillation as well. And the treatment for it is still in evolution. It's a disease that's been around, of course, forever. And we're still really working on treatment options. So today, I hope to give everyone an overview where we're at with atrial fibrillation, where we're going, and all the options available. Um, I believe truly, um, since uh, the very late 90s and into um, uh, this century, we are really moving forward with options for atrial fibrillation. So I think the future is bright in this regard. So uh, goals of this talk, um, they asked me to write those, so I thought I'd put them in the beginning, to identify with uh, patients with atrial fibrillation as symptomatic or asymptomatic. The reason why that comes to be very important is some of the options I'm going to talk about for treatment are based on whether somebody is symptomatic. It's not to say we don't treat asymptomatic patients, but some of the treatments are indicated, especially invasive treatments, if somebody is symptomatic. Um, I think the newest terminology, as you know, with all diseases, terminology always changes. It's just like the heart failure terminology is always changing. AFib terminology, we've tried to simplify it as paroxysmal, persistent, and permanent. I'll go through those definitions. Um, I'll review briefly at least uh, a firm data, which is on rate control versus rhythm control. Again, we're coming into that symptoms, yes or no uh, area. And I think we've really surged ahead on uh, treatment, aggressive identification and treatment of the biggest risk with atrial fibrillation, which is thromboembolic disease. And so um, CHADS2 VASC scoring and has blood scoring, everybody should have that. And the beauty in 2019 is there's an app for both of those for your smartphones, meaning um, if you're a busy physician in family practice, uh, in internal medicine, in nephrology, it doesn't matter, hemong, you could easily score your patients. And I'll talk about scoring and what those scores mean, but I do believe in uh, 2019, we are much more aggressive with scoring and properly anticoagulating people. And I will, again, review some of that data briefly. This talk isn't long enough to review all the detailed data, but that's really important. Everyone here, if you don't have it, download the app. Um, identify appropriate ablation candidates, which of course is one of my passions, and I'll help discuss that today. And then identify also people who are options for another invasive treatment, which is either a left atrial occlusion or a left atrial elimination device. Remembering again that the left atrial appendage is the, what we're occluding or eliminating is uh, what's most important for clot formation for thromboembolic disease. So the simple stuff here, um, which everyone knows, sinus rhythm beginning in the sinus node in the upper right atrium, conducting across Bachman's bundle to the left atrium, then to the AV node, then down the right and left bundles. That's normal rhythm. Atrial fibrillation, very easy to recognize, again, for patients that are questioning or uh, people in the audience are wondering when they're having palpitations, whether they're having atrial fibrillation. Again, free on all the smartphone stores are apps to download to evaluate the regularity or ir irregularity of your heart rhythm. We'll talk a little bit about that. But um, we have uh, atrial fibrillation and sinus rhythm there for us to uh, see. Risk factors for atrial fibrillation. Let me make it clear, you don't need to have a risk factor to have atrial fibrillation. 
My first consult in the office today was a 24-year-old with no risk factors with atrial fibrillation. So don't feel in the audience that if you're young and healthy that you're safe from this disease because perhaps you're not. Uh, the pediatric uh, electrophysiologist who I know well in Iowa City, he does AFib ablations regularly on children under the age of 18. But here are the classic risk factors, uh, age over 55 to 60, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy, any ejection fraction below normal has increased risks, structural or valvular heart disease, whether it's aortic, mitral, or tricuspid, they all often lead to left atrial enlargement, which leads to atrial fibrillation. Untreated atrial flutter, again, atrial flutter is, I call it, for my patients, I call it the sister arrhythmia. Typical atrial flutter originates in the right atrium. Atrial fibrillation, we'll be speaking, is initially at least a left atrial disease. So they are sister arrhythmias. If you don't aggressively treat your patient's atrial flutter, they likely will have atrial fibrillation. Uh, chronic lung disease, whether it's asthma or COPD, sleep apnea, obesity. Two large trials have now come out showing specifically that BMI is greater than 30. Those patients are high risk for not responding to medications for their atrial fibrillation and having recurrence after an AFib ablation. So um, weight is an issue. It needs to be addressed. We need to openly discuss these risk factors with our patients. Um, alcohol or stimulant use, um, especially in the excessive um, one cup of coffee. Your patients don't need to stop drinking coffee or el completely eliminate alcohol, but certainly in excess and serious illness or infection. A lot of the hospitalists here or ED doctors will see patients coming in with pneumonia, sepsis, UTIs go into AFib. It's also common in that post-op phase, post-op day three is classic for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation even after an elective or planned surgery. So symptoms, uh, some people have symptoms, some people don't. Often palp uh, tachypalpitations, lightheadedness, dizziness, breathlessness, chest discomfort. Uh, some patients, when they come in, will present with a positive troponin, more of a type 2 mild elevation due to relative demand ischemia in this rapid arrhythmia. But always remember some patients are completely asymptomatic. And so um, some people show up to some of the primary care docs offices for a pre-op for a planned surgery, and they're found to be an atrial fibrillation. So there's just a little simple diagram of the symptoms. So classification. And again, I think this is important. When communicating with your colleagues or communicating with your cardiologists, it's important to be using that we're all on the same page. A lot of people are put in the diagnosis of just atrial fibrillation. And it's very important to know whether it's paroxysmal, persistent, or permanent. So um, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation occurs intermittently. These are patients who can go back into sinus rhythm without a cardioversion and without medications to convert. Um, this can last for seconds, minutes, hours, or up to seven days. Once you break that seven-day marker, you've already dropped down into the persistent group. But paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is probably how most every patient's atrial fibrillation begins. And because it's paroxysmal, a lot of pa patients don't come to medical attention because their palpitations resolve, they feel fine, they think maybe it's anxiety, maybe it's what they ate, maybe it was something else, and so they don't come in. So often we're seeing people in the early or late persistent phase. Um, persistent patients often need medication or direct current cardioversion to convert. These are people lasting seven days up to a year. It's considered late persistent or verging on permanent if they're lasting greater than a year. And so again, I think terminology, in electrophysiology, we like to differentiate the early persistent versus the late persistent. But I think at least when communicating with uh, consultants or even assessing patients, getting them classified properly is very important. Because atrial fibrillation begets atrial fibrillation. The more somebody has this arrhythmia, the more they're going to have this arrhythmia. There's many reasons why, but mostly, um, at the chamber level and even at the molecular level, it's a disorganized uh, signal that is coming from hundreds of spots in both atria simultaneously. The more you have it, the more disorder continues. At the molecular level, there is fibrosis that occurs, left atrial dilatation. The more the left atrium dilates, the more AFib you have. And the more AFib you have, the more your left atrium dilates. So the 
most important thing is, again, is this early identification and decision for treatment plan, because when we see patients with severe atrial enlargement and long-standing atrial fibrillation, there's so much less we can offer them. So um, treatment, uh, important treatment issues to address are the anticoagulation, medication, whether we're going to control the rate or the rhythm, and then whether there will be attempt to restore a sinus rhythm. So uh, goals of treating AFib. Again, I'm going to be reviewing very briefly some very large studies that have been available over this past, I'll say, 15 years. Um, treating atrial, atrial fibrillation over time can increase risk of congestive heart failure and actually on the longevity curves will shorten life. Most importantly, though, the trials that have looked at rate versus rhythm control don't show an improvement in longevity with rhythm control, but rather improvement in quality of life. So we, we want to assess if patients are having symptoms. We certainly want to address the clotting risks by doing the scoring. No matter who it is, if the patient's declining antiarrhythmic or declining cardioversion, you at least want to try to get rates under control. Patients with poorly controlled rates of any tachyarrhythmia over the course of weeks or months will form a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy or reduced left ventricular function based solely on their rapid arrhythmia. So no treatment for atrial fibrillation is never an option. Um, we used to want to really aggressively get those rates controlled below 100, but recently a few studies have shown probably an average heart rate on an average day with activity of between the 85 to 110 range is acceptable. We don't need to make people bradycardic with our medications. So immediately when uh, this is the hospitalized or ED patient, we want to work on rate control and then long-term deci deciding what to come next. For rate control, uh, beta blockers, calcium blockers, and digoxin, nothing too fancy, and everyone here has seen all those drugs in action. Um, IV beta blockers and diltiazem are option for the pre-op or peri-op patient that is NPO. And again, trying to get that heart rate at or below 110. So um, antiarrhythmics. When I was in um, cardiology and electrophysiology training, my mentor would say uh, antiarrhythmics are proarrhythmia drugs with just a little bit of antiarrhythmic activity. And actually, that was like his joke of saying they don't work. And really, um, the drugs we have for atrial fibrillation are poor actors. Either their side effect profile is so long and so difficult that it's hard to get patients on the meds without side effects, or the medications just don't work. Um, it's pretty simple because some drugs are no longer available. Our options for treatment of atrial fibrillation are pretty limited when it comes to antiarrhythmic. I didn't make a whole slide on this, but we have class 1C agents, uh, propafenone and flecainide. We have class 3 agents, uh, sotalol, dofetilide, which is brand name Ticacin, dronetarone, which is brand named Multac, or amiodarone. We really don't have a lot of options. Our 1A agents we don't use anymore, and these drugs work poorly. On average, most of the drugs work at the 60 to 70 percent of patients in sinus rhythm at a year of using the drugs. And a lot of patients who see, a, excuse me, a lot of practitioners who see AFib patients will see them come back infrequently with recurrences. So back in 2002, uh, big news hit the world of EP, which was the AFFIRM trial. It was uh, separating patients to solely rate control versus solely rhythm control. And actually, they found that patients with rhythm control, antiarrhythmics, cardioversion, and maybe even an ablation to try to keep them in sinus rhythm, were hospitalized more frequently and reported more side effects of meds than the rate control patients. So some cardiologists said, I I'm not going to even try to put people in sinus for them anymore. But the real issue with that study was symptomatic patients felt amazingly better when they were given options for uh, rhythm control. And so we really, again, want to talk to patients about symptoms. Even though some people don't feel the rumbling, racing, or irregularity, fatigue, I think, for me, is one of the most common symptoms. Fatigue and just overall um, feeling poorly. A lot of family members will report that their family member is symptomatic when the patient states they feel fine. Um, we've had patients with absolutely um, poor interactive skills when in atrial fibrillations, and even some, I consider some of my patients have a personality change when they go into atrial fibrillation. 
just because they feel poorly, although it's hard for them to pinpoint a specific symptom. So um, I always tell people I can't, I'm not a good joke teller, so I find one. So this one states uh, he was doing fine before Sheena ripped the EKG patches off his chest and he went into cardiac arrest. So that's um, for all the nurses out there. Um, so antiarrhythmics, um, not very good. Efficacy is not very good and no silver bullet. We're trying to give an oral medication to stabilize atrial electrical status in a patient with a disorganized rhythm. It's just hard to do that. I don't think we're ever going to have a perfect drug for atrial fibrillation. So that's why I'll be talking about ablation. But anyway, um, we'll move on to anticoagulation. Uh, a CHADS2 VAS score is key. Everybody who is evaluated for atrial fibrillation, I believe, even in the ED, H&P, needs to have a score. Um, sometimes I think that uh, one physician will get a really good history and add something to the score that another physician didn't know about. So that's very important. Um, I think over the course of time, warfarin slash Coumadin is falling out of favor. A lot of the trials comparing, I'm going to be using these words interchangeably. Inter, uh, they used to be called novel oral anticoagulants. They're not novel anymore. So we're now, again, this is a change in terminology, referring to all of the newer direct oral anticoagulants as direct oral anticoagulants. That'll be our group of uh, Pradaxa, Eloquis, Zeralto, Sevasa. But uh, the large studies, and I will show that for non-valvular atrial fibrillation, probably have marked superiority over warfarin. So except for pricing, we're trying to push as many patients as we can to the directs. Um, certainly, we know there's an increased risk of stroke and heart failure with atrial fibrillation. I thoroughly apologize when I made this slide. My ages came off the bottom. So this is uh, 55, 65, 75, and 85, and the relative risk um, goes up with age. There's a little drop there, but um, as the neurologists know, we s now are currently seeing a lot of patients with cryptogenic strokes, trying to monitor them for atrial fibrillation in various ways. We know that there's a connection between the left atrial appendage clot and stroke with AFib. Here's a TEE image. This is a great TEE picture of the left atrial appendage, and there's a thrombus in that. So um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but again, I, I wasn't kidding about the app for your phone. Everyone can download the Chad's Vask and Has Bled app, and it's super simple. You basically open it for any patient you're seeing, um, add up their numbers, and here's a simple uh, thing. For Chad's 2 Vask scoring a store, score of 2 or greater, all you need is 2 points to start benefiting from anticoagulation for your atrial fibrillation. And this includes paroxysmal. You do not need to be persistent or permanence to benefit. Um, please note that just being a female gives you a point. So even my 30-year-old females with the AFib, they already have a point. If you're a female and you have high blood pressure, you need anticoagulation even if you're 32 years old. Uh, a male with those same two risk factors would not. The score would be one. Um, but congestive heart failure, as you continue to age, you get more points. So you get a point from 65 to 74. If you're above 75, you get another point. So as you can imagine, the points add up extremely quickly. It's very easy to hit a two. All you have to do is add two. You're there, and you need to discuss with your patient anticoagulation. All the studies have been done. The studies to prove anticoagulation superior to aspirin, those were done in the 80s. So aspirin's not an option for treatment for atrial fibrillation if it's a recurrence. Now, I mean, I'm not talking about one post-op cholecystectomy AFib, but recurrent atrial fibrillation. So the has blood scoring, probably less people think about that, but that's looking at all of the reasons why um, people aren't started on anticoagulation. Um, uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, creatinine clearance of less than 50, not just abnormal renal function, but significant reduced renal function. Stroke, those uh, stroke patients who have had an event and we don't want them to bleed into that area, we need to decide on proper anticoagulation. Um, this all is variable. Um, if they're on warfarin or Coumadin and they have very labile INRs, um, elderly, drugs or alcohol use, you know, as you'll see, um, fall is not on here. I still unfortunately see too many elderly people 
who their primary physician feels they're at risk for a fall, I'll often ask them, and they've actually never fallen. But they're frail. They could fall. Anybody could fall. The older a patient is, the higher their risk for stroke with AFib. And I understand when all of you see older patients, you're thinking they might fall more likely than my 40-year-old patient. But we can't miss anticoagulating our senior patients. So even though they could fall, often they don't. So we need to get them. So you know, you want to look at, I'll just go back one, you want to look at the CHADS VAS scoring. And then if you think they're at increased risk for bleeding, I'll be talking a little bit later about other options that don't include warfarin or direct oral anticoagulants for um, these patients. So um, the quick look is, do they have a mechanical valve? Um, PCI with a stent that you're, you have them already on antiplatelet agents, consider warfarin. A very low creatinine clearance or end-stage renal disease with some exceptions, we consider warfarin. And then here's the drugs. And um, you know, this is one of those slides when I'm in the audience, I'm just like, I can't believe they put up a slide like that and think I can read it. So sorry I just did that. But um, I think you might have a copy of this, and this is all available. You know, I love the internet. It's right there for you. But this is just looking at all the oral anticoagulants and pro appropriate dose reduction for renal dysfunction. And we know that Eliquis, um, for age greater than 85, weight less than or equal to 120 pounds, and a creatinine of 1.5. It's hard to hit all those, but it's usually an elderly female with some renal insufficiency. We reduce their Eliquis dosing. Otherwise, the renal failure patients mostly still are warfarin. So um, the rely rocket AF, Aristotle engaged, and a large meta-analysis for those people who still love giving their patients warfarin, the direct oral anticoagulants win. And that's on risk of bleeding and redu reduction in stroke. So I think we know uh, the directs are superior. Again, um, a lot of our patients are limited on price, depending on their uh, pharmacy plan. All of the direct oral anticoagulants are expensive. If they have good pharmacy coverage or a prescription coverage, pardon me, they can get it at a reasonable rate. If they're paying a uh, full price or almost full price, they're asked to give out between $450 and $600 a month for anticoagulation. Good news is with effort, and, and some of our good nurses are here today, we have cards for people, we have plans that we try to get them on if they really can't afford, and some people just can't get there, and so they're on warfarin. Uh, so bleeding shows actually a lower risk of fatal bleeding, despite the fact that there's no antidote. So um, Pradaxa has a reversal agent, Eloquis has one available, limited, albeit. Um, but everyone's afraid, well, if I give them a direct oral anticoagulant and they come in with a motor vehicle accident injury and I can't reverse it, then they won't get life-saving treatment. But actually, the analysis of all 12 trials, over 100,000 people, showed still fatal bleeding was lower in the direct oral anticoagulant. So it's best to prevent a, a bleed than to treat a bleed. So. Um, we have to take into consideration every patient's different. You know, I just feel atrial fibrillation is one of those diseases that every patient is different. And a lot of my patients come to me and say, well, my brother's in uh, Denver and he's doing this, but each patient is different. So it's important to consider each as an individual. Um, for uh, people who can't be on warfarin or a direct oral anticoagulant due to bleeding, uh, recurrent problems, intolerance of drugs, um, chronic other medical problems that are prohibitive. There are now left atrial appendage therapies to either eliminate or close off the left atrial appendage and keep people off anticoagulation. So there's two devices. The FDA has released the Watchman device, which we are implanting, and the Lariat is still in trials. So this is the Watchman device. It is a transeptal approach to the left atrium an EP doc and an echo uh, physician doing a TEE at the time. The left atrial appendage is sized. There's a choice of about five sizes of a watchman. It's fit in, uh, placed, and uh, it takes a few weeks to endothelialize. And 
then you come off medication. Our group at the end, I'll tell you about a few trials that are available to patients, but we're in a trial of looking at no anticoagulation afterwards, just uh, Plavix and aspirin. Probably is gonna work just fine. Uh, the other option is a Lariat device, which is just as it says, it's actually a um, pericardial-based procedure, uh, sub-xiphoid access to the pericardium as if someone was tapping an effusion, placement of a, uh, I'm not going to say it's a suture, but it's not much thicker than a suture around the left atrial appendage and basically closing that off. It deteriorates over the course of a few months and is gone when re-CT'd, and that eliminates left atrial appendage. That not only helps with thromboembolic disease, but we find that the left atrial procedures actually are also reducing atrial fibrillation because likely that rim of the left atrial appendage is arrhythmogenic. So these left atrial appendage therapies now are only for people who can't take warfarin or direct oral anticoagulants but we are part of a large trial called the AMAZE trial that combines ablation plus a lariat, and possibly that will be shown to help with just AFib recurrence. So um, the Watchman device, again, that's FDA approved. You need what is considered appro appropriate rationale to use it. And here's the appropriate rationale um, that the FDA requires to use it. Either you've, uh, the patient's had a major, major bleeding event. Uh, recurrent GI bleed's really all you need. Um, minor bleeding events taken into consideration. Lifestyle at risk. If somebody is in a very risky lifestyle for injury, um, doing high uh, voltage uh, electricity, doing roofing, things where they really may fall, they can be considered for it. Um, and dis embolic stroke despite oral anticoagulants. So there has to be a rationale because, of course, as you can imagine, both Medicare and the insurance companies are watching closely and trying to reduce or eliminate um, too many being placed. And probably this is something that shouldn't be placed in every AFib patient. So there's just another picture of the Watchman device. Here's the Watchman in place. You can see that's where it is deployed right there. You can see that little raised portion. And you saw the left atrial appendage before. This is completely closing over it. And then this is what it looks like. This is a pathology not related to the device implant. But basically, uh, nine months later, is completely closed over. The left atrial appendage no longer can be a place for stasis or clot. And this was in canine mo uh, models. As early as 30 days, um, the area was already closing over. Currently, if a patient receives a Watchman device, they have to go on anticoagulation for a period of time afterwards. So often we're talking with the GI doctor as well. They're going to go back on their oral anticoagulant for a few weeks. But again, there is a trial underway using no anticoagulants after the Watchman, just Saplavix and aspirin. That probably will work well. If so, we really can have a big impact, especially on the either patients with hematologic disease or recurrent bleeds. So where does ablation fit in for treatment and what an ablation can do and can't do? Well, um, the most important thing I can say is uh, we don't have a cure for atrial fibrillation. Ablation is not a cure for atrial fibrillation. A lot of patients come to me or are sent to me thinking, oh, thank goodness, I'm finally going to get an ablation and my atrial fibrillation will be gone. It's not. It is purely a treatment. Um, the large trials done with either catheter-based radiofrequency ablation, which is heat, or balloon-based cryoablation show that patients have between a 75 to 85 percent reduction in atrial fibrillation. Now, I'm happy to say some patients have a reduction down to zero, and I've done some patients as long as 10 or 12 years ago, and they happily come back, and they're on, not on medication, and they're not having AFib, and I feel good, they feel good, and everyone's happy. That's not usually how the story goes. I wish I could tell you everyone would get that, but I don't. And I'm, I'm a real straight shooter when I talk to the patients and say, you still will have atrial fibrillation. It is a chronic disease. And even if we do an ablation and somebody's free of AFib for four or five years, they could come back at year six with more atrial fibrillation. So I think the big message is, at least in 2019, we don't consider this a curative uh, procedure. So a big trial that actually did not come to uh, the journals yet was presented last year at the Heart Rhythm Society annual meeting, which is something we had all EPs been waiting for. And here's what it was. It's called the Cabana trial. 
and it is looking at medical management of AFib, that means antiarrhythmics, rate controlling drugs, and plus or minus cardioversion versus ablation. Which is better? And of course, all the docs doing ablation out there, we were just sure this was going to be a shoe in for us, but it actually wasn't. Um, because the endpoints were to <coughs> look at all cause, all cause mortality, stroke, um, and cardiac arrest. And actually, AFib ablation didn't have a, a big impact on mortality, cardiac arrest, or sudden death. It didn't. What it did was improve symptoms. That's why I bring up the really important point of talk to your patients about symptoms. So here's the um, all-cause mortality drug and ablation. So again, this is antiarrhythmic drug versus ablation over 60 months. Not much separation. When we looked to first recurrence of AFib, ablation had much longer to the first recurrence of AFib compared to drug. When we looked at um, death, disabling stroke, serious bleeding, uh, the p-value just made it. Ablation was superior. But what the results really said is that time to first AFib, AFib recurrence is less. People have improved symptoms and the mortality was not affected. So doing an ablation for your patient's AFib will not help them live longer. If they're symptomatic, it can really help them feel better, function better. Um, there was slightly reduced risk event in the ablation group, but the quality of life was uh, improved mostly in the ablation group. So um, what is ablation? It is different than supraventricular tachycardia ablation. A lot of people, um, so SVT has been uh, ablated in the U.S. since uh, 1989 regularly, not in trials, but places around the U.S. since 1989. I think supraventricular tachycardia and atrial flutter ablation have reached, after many years, and it's taken us a long time, mainstream where people recognize that it is great treatment for supraventricular tachycardia. For a focal tachycardia with 2019 quality 3D mapping, an SVT ablation should be curative. This is the word cure, not for AFib. This is for a focal arrhythmia uh, 97 to 98% of the time. We've got that one. So atrial flutter cure rate probably 85 to 90% of the time, not as high. And again, AFib, I never use the word cure. But here's how the atrial fibrillation circa 2019 goes. Because we have mapping systems and pre-procedure, we obtain a CT scan of the left atrium. We have data of where we're working. Uh, beginning in the mid-1990s, we realized that the trigger for most atrial fibrillation comes from uh, within the pulmonary veins. Who knew? Everybody has at least four three pulmonary veins that empty into the left atrium. Some people have four, some people have six. Um, usually before ablation, I'll obtain an echocardiogram and a CT of the heart to see how many veins patients have and um, where they're located. Uh, during the procedure for a PVI ablation, because again, we're trying to get rid of the triggers in the veins, uh, patients are uh, put to sleep under general anesthesia. Uh, wires are put in femoral access only, and a transeptal approach, which is a long, skinny needle from the femoral vein, intentionally puncturing a hole to get into the left atrium, heparin's begun. Um, I use a small wire to collect data. This is all electrical or voltage data in the left atrium, and subsequently PrEP. Currently, we've mainstreamed this so easily. Um, I have a 28 millimeter balloon that freezes the opening of all four of those veins. The balloon is prepped, placed into the left atrium. Heparin's going the entire time. ACTs to check the level of heparinization every 15 minutes regularly, and the veins are isolated. Um, current technology, the veins can be isolated probably in about four minutes with freeze technique. Um, when I'm isolating the right-sided veins, their phrenic nerve is running right outside the heart of that vein, so I use a small wire to pace the phrenic nerve like a hiccup every three seconds to make sure that the nerve is not frozen. If it is, we need to come off freezing immediately. The esophagus is located right behind the left atrium where the ablation is performed. There has been reports, never have I seen, but there has been reports of left atrial esophageal fistulas after ablation. Left atrium and esophagus are two chambers you do not want to communicate. So we have to be very careful to prevent erosion in the esophagus from the ablation. 
So the uh, anesthesiologist places a temperature probe, which I move up and down to the level of the balloon. If that temperature on the probe in the esophagus drops more than about 5 degrees Celsius, um, the freeze is stopped. So we try to make this um, both effective, quick, and safe. Um, after the procedure, the heparin's discontinued, reversed with protamine, all the wires are removed, patients extubated in home in 24 hours or less. Patients need to be uh, symptomatic for an ablation. So the current recommendations, and again, I'm going to tell you about a few up ongoing trials, you have to have symptomatic recurrent atrial fibrillation and have tried one antiarrhythmic therapy. Remember, this is treatment, not cure. If someone's asymptomatic and really tells you, I'm in AFib, but I'm still working full time, I have a patient who uh, does whitewater rapid canoeing in AFib, and he's completely asymptomatic, we shouldn't put them through an invasive procedure that has risks. So currently, they need to have symptoms. So there's just pictures of cryo versus radiofrequency ablation. And then here are those pulmonary veins. And truly, I mean, I'm no kidding about that. I left fellowship um, and came here in 1996. And papers were just starting to talk about triggers for AFib possibly being in the pulmonary veins. Um, that has not always been known. This is just a diagram of the balloon as it's a wire is used to get into the vein. The balloon is brought to the opening of the vein and then frozen. Um, still, many electrophysiologists around the country use uh, heat or radio frequency to do the ablation. One of my partners, one of my younger partners that just left training, uh, wasn't trained on to use the balloon, so he still uses heat. In my opinion, or at least in my hands, it takes longer when I used radio frequency ablation for an AFib. Excuse me, yes, when I use heat or radio frequency for an AFib ablation, those procedures would last five, sometimes six hours. And now I could do an atrial fibrillation ablation in two and a half hours and do two in a day. Sometimes I kind of threaten the staff, I could do three in a day. So actually, it's a shorter procedure, it's a benefit to the patient. The less time they're under general anesthesia, the less time anybody's on the table for any procedure, the safer it is. So it's a bonus to have a quicker. I don't go fast just because I can. It's better for my patients. I did an 80-year-old on Monday. I used to never do people in their eighth decade because of risks of a procedure. I finished her case in two and a half hours. She went home the next morning at 8 a.m. So what other options do we have? Pacemakers. So all my patients ask me this. Well, I've had AFib, and this hasn't worked, and this hasn't worked. Can't you just put in a pacemaker to regulate my heart? Well, as all of you know, uh, pacemakers are Brady devices for low heart rates. It does not treat atrial fibrillation. That being said, current technology pacemakers do have something that we could program in called anti-tachycardia pacing that does allow us actually to deliver rapid pacing in the atrium early in AFib to try to organize it and terminate it. Works probably about 40% of the time, but it's not a cure for atrial fibrillation. But for some patients that are in rapid atrial fibrillation, cannot tolerate or have hypotension on multiple AV nodal blocking drugs, beta blockers, and calcium blockers, are candidates for a pacemaker with an AV node ablation. <clears throat> now, an AV node ablation is not an AFib ablation. Their atria will still be in atrial fibrillation. But with the AV node ablation, those atrial fib beats are no longer rapidly conducted to the ventricles. So the pacemaker wire is in place and there to pace. Because the pacemaker wire will go in first, and after the ablation, the patient's heart rate will be 40 or less. Sometimes it's nothing. Sometimes there's no escape rhythm. And they'll be 100% pacemaker dependent. So a blatant pace is great for that subclass of patient. Usually ends up being very elderly patients with very rapid AFib who we can't uh, get good rate control on. They need permanent anticoagulation, and they will be pacemaker dependent, which again, I don't say that to patients to scare them, but truly, if a wire were to dislodge, or if the device were to have a problem, they would have a very low underlying rhythm and possibly no underlying rhythm. So we use that treatment as kind of a last effort. Uh, surgery, I do have two of my surgical partners that do uh, what's called a Cox Maze 4 procedure. That is an open chest, full sternotomy, uh, cut and sew procedure for atrial fibrillation. I probably, over the course of 
these 23 years sent maybe four patients for this procedure and have seen a few others. Uh, the surgeons do a very good job, but we're talking about full open heart surgery for AFib. So we're choosing the most symptomatic patients who have failed at least two catheter ablations. And of course, usually they have failed every antiarrhythmic drug. So that's a special group of people. Um, uh, surgery, they do a great job, actually. They usually get an organized rhythm, whether it's sinus or an atrial rhythm, almost all the time. The good news is the surgeons remove the left atrial appendage, but it's still a very big procedure. Um, usually ends up being younger patients uh, who have failed all the other treatments. And again, we don't use that much. So here's the post av note ablation. When we asked you to turn off all electronic devices, we didn't mean your husband's pacemaker. So um, that would be the ablatant pace patient. So we don't want that to happen. Um, I think patient education is key. I am very big on prevention. Although I do atrial fibrillation and atrial fibrillation ablation for a living, if I could prevent people from having atrial fib by risk factor modification, I would. Um, some patients don't have risk factors, and so, you know, it's not anyone's fault that they're an AFib, but we could do a lot as prevention. Um, the patients can eliminate the other triggers. So it's all those contributing factors. Uh, hypertension needs to be aggressively controlled. Diabetes, you know, a lot of my patients, you know, they see their family practice doc, I'll say, what's your hemoglobin A1C? They'll say, it's doing really good, it's eight. But I mean, that is, that's not really good. So I know, you know, a lot of you in the audience have the big job of trying to get all that under control. Um, again, obesity, we know BMIs above 30 directly correlate with recurrence of atrial fibrillation after ablation. So um, we don't have good answers for patients on ways to help them lose weight. We're still working on that one as well. But we really need to find ways to help our patients get their weight down because um, otherwise uh, they're going to have more atrial fibrillation. Some of the triggers are there, uncontrolled hypertension, uh, untreated sleep apnea. Every one of my patients who falls into the persistent atrial fibrillation category, I don't care how skinny they are, they get a sleep study. I probably, in my days of ordering sleep studies on persistent AFib, this isn't all comers, this is persistent AFib patients, seven days or more, I probably have had less than 1% normal sleep studies. Now available are home sleep studies. Most insurances are paying for that. Uh, the sleep doctors feel that they're pretty darn uh, accurate. It, just get a sleep study. I always tell my patients it's easy. It's non-invasive. I mean, people are willing to sign up for a PVI ablation before they're willing to treat their sleep apnea. It's just crazy. It's one of those things we can't miss. Um, Post-ablation, um, medication monitoring, smartphone apps, other devices, all really um, important. Uh, I was talking to uh, patients and some of my staff today about the Alive Core. First of all, I'll say this. There's free apps on the Droid and Apple App Store to monitor your heart rate. They use the uh, camera on your phone to detect your pulse. Now this Alive Core is expensive. So I saw a 24 year old with AFib this morning and probably has been having events since he was 17. And his parents and his girlfriend came with him to decide, you know, how can we close, more closely monitor this young man? Um, this is uh, $99, it's expensive, but it gives a pretty good, um, you know, almost EKG quality. It'll give you time, date, you could record symptoms and they can send that my way. One of my partners after ablation encourages patients to pay for this and buy it. I don't tell people really to buy it, but if they can afford it, there's a lot of people that spend a lot of, uh, the buy things that aren't as maybe important to their health for $99, but this can be really effective. Uh, you, get it, you can get it online or other places. So um, patients know more about their diseases than me. I must get a faster modem, higher speed internet uh, access than them which is true, you know, I think our, our patients, I love educated patients. Now, you know, Dr. Google is not who I'm talking about, but when patients really are willing to go to uh, good websites, and I think there's a lot of good, more now than ever, there's really good, accurate information out there. I want my patients to be educated. Um, AFib is treatable, not curable. Long-term uh, risk factor modification is key. Uh, if they're symptomatic, aggressive, early attempts at sinus rhythm. Um, as an EP doc, I'm always happy to see people after their first event. Am I going to force them into an ablation after a first event? Of course not. 
but give them the options, do aggressive risk factor modification, give them the story, I think it's really important. Uh, early referral for PVI ablation um, is better than using antiarrhythmic drugs on some of these patients. So just to bring you up to date, um, I'm involved in some trials that are looking at like what's going to be next, what's going to be here for five years, for in the next five years. So stop AF first is a trial I've enrolled several patients on. That's taking a patient with one or more AFib event lasting under seven days and offering them ablation before offering them other, any drugs. It's a randomized trial, so I get a lot of patients from all over who want an ablation, but they make it randomized to medication, which would be an antiarrhythmic. At 90 days, they can cross over for an ablation. The AMAZE trial is for persistent, that's seven days or greater, AFib, who get an AFib ablation, plus the Lariat, or they're randomized to the ablation alone. So for a lot of patients, they get that opportunity to have the left atrial appendage exclusion, or afterwards, after uh, a handful of weeks, they can come off anticoagulation. The ASAP2 is using the Watchman device that I showed you that fits over the left atrial appendage, uh, using aspirin and Plavix for AFib for patients who can have the direct oral anticoagulants. So that's a great option, especially for the, um, again, the GI bleeders, the hemonc patients that are having recurrent bleeding, um, to have probably a trial that will show us they don't need to go back on their oral anticoagulants. The future's bright. I think that um, since I've been in practice, we've come a huge way with AFib. We're not there yet. Um, still looking at better protocols for MRI imaging, looking at fibrosis. We know there's familial AFib. I have multiple groups of family members in their 30s and 40s, siblings and their parents with AFib. So there's probably some genetic AFib for the young. MRI imaging, looking at fibrosis. But um, still, I think um, sometimes it's the real hard work, aggressive treatment of high blood pressure, diabetes, sleep apnea, and obesity is always going to be the hard way. And, um, but I think we're coming, oh, we, my last slide has to. So um, it's a pacemaker for your heart, but you could download apps for your liver, kidney, lungs, and pancreas. None of those jokes I made up. But um, I'd love to answer any questions. Thank you. Someone asked me earlier if they had supraventricular tachycardia ablated, are they at increased risk for atrial fibrillation? No. But if you've had atrial flutter, you're at increased risk for atrial fibrillation. 30% of patients with atrial flutter subsequently have atrial fibrillation. But supraventricular tachycardia is such a focal disease that that does not increase risk. Now, I will say this. Some SVT patients go from supraventricular tachycardia and then into AFib. So again, like the 24-year-old I saw this morning, I always question whether his event began as an organized SVT, and by the time he came to the ED here, he was in atrial fib, or whether it's just plain old atrial fib. So, um, so there's a little correlation, but most of the time, uh, it's a fib and flutter association, but not an SVT association. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, um, I, you know, the studies don't give all the details, but uh, increase right heart pressure, increase uh, atrial pressures, atrial stretch, and it's probably the comorbidities associated with obesity because obesity often carries with it the hypertension, diabetes diagnosis. But um, obesity alone was looked independently in two large groups of ablation patients with recurrence and found to be the one major risk factor. So uh, likely uh, intracardiac pressure, especially right heart pressure. A lot of our obese patients have sleep apnea or obesity hypoventilation and that atrial stretch um, chamber size, left atrial chamber dilatation correlates with more atrial fibrillation. So um, uh, again, there is a physician, uh, uh, used to be the president of the Heart Rhythm Society two years ago. And um, they have a huge, in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, part of a huge practice with probably the premier AFib ablation group. I think about six EPs. 
four EP labs, and they just do ablations all day, every day. And people come from everywhere. They do a very nice job. Um, but he became so frustrated with the disease that him and his wife went on a trip to Japan to kind of like one of those blue zones, if anyone's read the book Blue Zone or knows about the blue zones, but one of the blue zones to learn, like, how do people live in these areas that heart disease is very low, longevity is very high, and came back and tried to initiate before he would ablate anybody. And this, again, is the president of Heart Rhythm Society. So um, he made them become part of his program where they had they would, like, meet every day, walk as a group, make meals together, eat healthy. And before he did their ablation, their A1Cs had to be below 5, their blood pressure had to be, and they had to lose so many pounds. Um, and so I, I think lifestyle is big. He probably took it kind of the, to the extreme. He actually would show like movies of him doing some of this in Japan and stuff. But um, I just think lifestyle is, is pretty key with a lot of our diseases. But um, all the general practitioners here know the um, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, they're all tied together as with sleep apnea. Thanks very much, Denise. That was a, a great presentation. I'm wondering about um, genetics. Yes. Is there what is the genetics behind it? Are there any genetic studies, and potentially in the future, any genetic cure? Yeah. You know, I know you said there is no cure, but yeah. is is that on the horizon? For sure, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that um, like many of the channelopathies, so an EP, you know, we used to be able to genetically test for a few diseases. And now it's just blown up. And then we come to the fact, even the genetic diseases we feel really confident about, like Brugada syndrome, um, the different long QT syndromes, we still realize that even with a negative genetic test, you still can have the disease, the non-compaction cardiomyopathies. I mean, I can go on and on. We don't have a specific marker for AFib. And certainly, they are studying the familial ones. And again, this is you know those large group of you know every family member in their early to mid 40s is having problems with AFib. But so far, we don't have a specific gene or a specific marker, but a lot of people are looking at that. But do I feel that there will be a way using genetic therapy or stem cell that's more of that personalized medicine? It's probably going to fall in there uh, someday as well. I still think that um, making all those risk factor modifications and the healthy living, that's, again, is still the hardest thing to do. And it's the one thing that if we don't do, we'll still have AFib. Thank you for your presentation as well. Mm -hmm. um, my question was regarding the sleep apnea and when you say you recommend that they have a sleep study. You said if they're in persistent AFib for seven days or more? Yeah, um, you know, well, actually, I recommend sleep studies for almost everyone. No, uh, almost everyone. <laughs> because I see a lot of atrial fib. Um, uh, we, in my office, um, my staff does uh, upper earth sleepiness score, and everybody who crosses a threshold of my office, everybody, everybody. And um, if their score is high or borderline high, they get a sleep study. Uh, but it's a mandate for my patients with persistent AFib. Because as you all know, anyone here who's recommended a sleep study, the patients don't want to do it. I mean, they have this vision of, I think, you know, uh, 20 years ago, or maybe even 10 years ago, of like wearing some horrible mask and this loud machine and they're going to be like this, you know, freak of nature if they have it treated. It's a huge contributor to so much, especially arrhythmia-wise, that it's just a mandate. But, you know, you could even have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and if you have a uh, positive Epworth sleepiness score and or um, a large neck size or family members that say, I mean, we have a lot of, you know, witnesses that say, yes, grandpa does stop breathing multiple times a night. I recommend a sleep study. I'm very quick on the trigger. I'll tell you this, like um, this is like humbling, but I'll tell you the truth. I do a lot of ablations, I do a lot of pacemakers and all those type of things. I probably have had a bigger impact on many of my patients' lives by treating their sleep disordered breathing than I have by any of the invasive procedures I've done. Because it's a whole life improvement for someone with significant obstructive or central. You know, and I will bring this one thing up, too, because I'm bringing up exciting things coming. I'm going to be part of a uh, trial of a new system from Respicardia. It's FDA approved. So this isn't something that's just, like, coming out. But this is going to be real uh, for a periphrenic nerve pacing for central sleep apnea or combined sleep apnea, where um, I'll be inserting a device 
with a sensing electrode and a phrenic nerve low-level stimulant, not one that you'll feel the hiccup or see a patient with a lead dislodged movement, to stimulate um, the diaphragm for a central and combined sleep apnea. So I think we're moving into an area where not everyone's going to be wearing masks and, you know, this is so terrible. There's new treatments coming there as well, but um, probably my staff will say I order a sleep study on most all my arrhythmia patients. Well, thank you for your attention. I sure appreciate it. Have a nice day.